Quick, can you tell the difference between these three hand gestures? Well, I mean, of course you can. Your brain's got like billions and billions of neurons and millions of years of evolution behind it. But in the course of this 15 minute video, let's get our phones to do it too. So I have some grand plans of making a rock, paper, scissors app for my phone. One where we could play against real life people. But for that to work, the first step is to build an app that can analyze a picture of a hand gesture and tell me whether it is rock, paper, or scissors. It seems like a tricky job, but I think that with a little bit of machine learning, we can get it done. Now, if you want to follow along with this tutorial, what I've done so far is created a very simple app where I have a UI image and three buttons here. One to grab a photo from my image library, one to grab a photo using the camera, and another to display a live image feed. I also have a label where I can show our results and I have outlets for both the image and my label. Now, the code to hook up these first two buttons is probably something you've done before if you've ever used a UI image picker controller, but let me walk you through it anyway. In the code for fetching from my photo library, I've created an image picker and set the source type to photo library, and then here set the delegate to self. I'm also setting allows editing to be true, and this is actually quite important. Uh, trust me on this one. I'll explain it later, but this will make your life easier. In the code for fetching from the camera, I do almost the same thing, except that I set the source type to camera. And in my handler for running a live recording, I am leaving that blank for now because it is complicated. We'll get back to that later on. Now down here at the bottom of my file, I've set up an extension for these delegate methods. I've created an image picker controller did cancel method, which just dismisses the picker, and also a did finish picking media with info method, where I either grab the edited image or the original image, and I set that as my input image. Finally, over here in the info.plist file, I've gone ahead and added the privacy camera usage description option so that iOS can ask for the user's permission to take photos with the camera instead of, you know, crashing. Now, if you did all of this, you should now be able to take pictures or select photos from your gallery and they will show up in your UI image. Again, there's nothing specific to Firebase or MLKit up until this point. If you've ever added an image picker in your app, this should be pretty standard. Now, the next thing I have already done with my project is gotten Firebase up and running. I have created a project in the Firebase console and attached my iOS application to that project. I've downloaded some constants through a plist file, installed a library or two using CocoaPods, and called firebase.configure in my app delegate. Don't know what I'm talking about? Watch the setup video first and then come on back. Okay, so we've got our Firebase project set up and we've got our app set up to take pictures. All we need to do now is fill out that teensy little section of our code to do all the machine learning magic. So let's talk machine learning here. As you might already know, MLKit comes with a number of machine learning models already built and ready for you to use. These include models to identify and recognize text, or detect faces in an image, or label images based on their contents. Now we have a couple of different models for that last one. There's a smaller model that can live on your device and a more comprehensive model that lives in the cloud. But here's the issue. Even the cloud-based model that recognizes over 10,000 different labels still has to be kind of general purpose. You can't have a model that detects every single object in the world. And depending on your app, you might have some very specific needs. Like maybe you're a retail company and you want your app to identify the specific models of items that you sell. Or you're a city agency trying to create a model that automatically looks for potholes on photos of a city street. So going back to my case, it's pretty unlikely that a general purpose image labeler is going to understand the difference between the hand gestures used in a rock, paper, scissors game. This is a good example of a situation that needs a custom image labeler. And if you had the time and effort and inclination, you could go ahead and build a machine learning model yourself. And to be clear, this is totally something we support. Thanks to libraries like TensorFlow, you can build a custom machine learning model, and MLKit has a very nice use your own ML model feature built just for this purpose. But not all of us know how to really build and train a good machine learning model, and getting it right can be kind of time consuming, and sometimes you just kind of wish somebody would go through the trouble of making one for you. And that's where MLKit's AutoML Vision Edge comes in. It makes use of Cloud AutoML to build an on-device custom machine learning model for us, which we can then use locally in our app. So here's what we're gonna do to get the power of machine learning into our app using Vision Edge. First, we're gonna upload a whole bunch of training data. This will consist of photos grouped by the labels we wanna classify them as. Next, we're gonna let AutoML work its magic by creating a machine learning model that can successfully identify these images. Finally, we're gonna download or publish the model that AutoML generates and use that to start identifying images in our app. All right, let's get started. 
So for training data, what I need is a bunch of sample photos with each of these hand gestures. And when it comes to training data, the general rule here is the more data, the better. AutoML recommends at least 100 photos per label, but really you want as much high quality data as you can get. You should also make sure you capture a variety of subjects in a variety of different situations. And you should make sure that these photos reflect how your app is gonna be used in the real world, not just like a sterile office setting. So my next step here would be to go around taking hundreds of pictures of hands and various rock, paper, scissor gestures from a bunch of different people at a bunch of different angles and gathering all that up as my training data. But because I want all of you to follow along with me in this video and I don't want us to spend the next several hours taking pictures of people's hands, I'm gonna use some sample data that's already available for use and you can find it in the link below. So go ahead and download it and then let's unzip the file because I wanna evaluate it based on these three criteria I just talked about. So from a quantity standpoint, I wanna point out that the original data set came with about 2,200 images. Now that's pretty good, but I also wanna make sure that you can follow along with this video using the free pricing plan in Firebase, and that limits us to 1,000 images per data set. So what you have here is a trimmed down version of the data set with about 900 images total. So from like a total amount of data standpoint, it's okay, but not great. If you were looking to build a real machine learning model for a production app, I would highly recommend upgrading to the Blaze plan. That will let you have up to a million images per data set, store multiple data sets, spend more time creating your model, and so much more. Now, looking at our data set from a variety standpoint, I do have some concerns here. You'll notice that there's not a lot of variety in the skin tone of these models, and it seems like the vast majority of the hands in this data set comes from men, and you know, that's not really great. You want your app to perform well with people of all ethnicities and genders, and for a real app, we want to have a more diverse section of people in our training data to make sure it works well with all of our users. Finally, from a modeling real world situations perspective, I have a couple other issues. You'll notice that all these photos are taken from the same top down angle with the hand coming in from the right. That matches the setup that this researcher originally used for his project, but it probably won't match the angle of a real rock, paper, scissors game where our opponent is directly in front of us. I think our model might struggle more in that situation. And finally, you might notice that all these photos are on the same green background. From what I've seen, this could be a problem if we start trying to take pictures of hands on a busy background. That's gonna be an experience that our model hasn't seen before, and that could throw it off. So again, if this were a data set that I'd wanna use in the real world, I'd probably wanna capture our hand poses in a variety of different backgrounds. Now, I know it sounds like I'm being really critical here, but I don't wanna be harsh on the author of this data set. This guy did all of the hard work of taking all these pictures and making them freely available for all of us to download out of the goodness of his heart. And so thank you, Julian, for all your hard work. I don't wanna look a gift scissors in the mouth. This is really just about making sure you think critically about your own data set as you're gathering up samples. One last thing, you'll notice that the data set is already structured in the way that we need it. Specifically, we have folders that are already named with the label that we want to apply to all these pictures inside. You can see that all my paper images, for instance, are in this photo called paper, and that's perfect. However, this one readme file where we nicely gave credit to the author of this data set, that's actually gonna mess up the parser. So let's delete it from our folder, and now we can zip up our data again. Okay, now all of our images are zipped up and ready to use. Let's go ahead to the Firebase console and start using them in our project. So uh, here in the Firebase console, I'm gonna select my project and I will select the ML kit panel. I'll click get started. And then I will click on the auto ML tab here at the top. Uh, now I will ask, yes, I want to enable auto ML in my project and I will click continue and wait a few minutes. Okay, once that's done, I'm gonna click on the add data set button here. Now here, it's asking me if I want a single label classification, which will assign just one label to a picture, or a multi-label classification, which might assign multiple labels to the same image. Since it would be illegal to throw more than one item in a game of rock, paper, scissors, I am gonna pick single label. And I'll give it the inventive name of rock, paper, scissors one. I'll click create, and now it's asking me to upload my images. So I will select that zip file I had earlier. Uh, this might take some time to process, so let's jump ahead a few minutes. Okay, images have been uploaded, valid, and imported. And in fact, I got this nice little email from Firebase telling me that my data set is ready, which is kind of nice. Thanks, Firebase. All right, let's head back to the console. So you can see here that all of my images have been assigned labels based on their parent folders. And I can see all the paper images here and the rock ones here and so on. If one of these were miscategorized or didn't have any labels, I could fix that by clicking on the image and selecting manage labels here to give it a different label. But everything's looking pretty good, so let's move on. 
I'm now going to click the Train Model button, and here I'm presented with a choice. Do I want a model that's more accurate, with the trade-off that it will be bigger and slower, or something that's smaller and faster, but maybe less accurate? In my case, I kind of want both. I want my model to work fast enough that it could identify hand signals in a live video feed, but you know, if it gets a signal wrong, my game kind of breaks, so it needs to be pretty accurate. So I think I will pick this middle option. I can also choose how long to train my model. The longer that the model trains, the more accurate it usually is, without having much of an impact on the model's size or speed, but I do have to pay for that computing time beyond what AutoML gives me for free. Because I'm on the free Spark plan, one hour is the only option I have right now, so I guess we'll go with that. Now I'll click Start Training and wait about an hour. I'll see you then. Okay, it's just about an hour later and I just got another nice email that my ML model is all done training. So let's take a look. So here I am back in the console. I am still in the Auto ML tab and here is my data. And now you can see down here, I have the model that's been created from the data set. So let's click on it and see what we got. So here it's telling me about this model. Down here are the evaluation details, and you'll notice it has a number of graphs and a score threshold. Basically, the way this kind of works is that when our ML model is analyzing a picture, it's going to have some kind of confidence level for every label that it comes up with for that picture. Now we can tell our model, only use this label if your confidence level is higher than this particular score, and that is our score threshold. If we set our threshold very high, then we'll only label cases where our model is very confident that it's correct, but we run the risk of our picture sometimes not getting a label even if the model would have guessed correctly. That's known as a false negative, and avoiding false negatives is being measured by this recall score. If we set our threshold low, then we'll get a label assigned in more cases, but there is a greater possibility that our model will be wrong and their picture will be assigned the wrong label. That's known as a false positive, and avoiding false positives is measured by this precision score. Given our data set, it looks like a threshold right around 0.5 is a good balance between false negatives and false positives. It's going to assign a label to most of my images, but it won't guess wrong too often. Down here, we can see how often our model might confuse one label with another. How does it know this? Well, basically, whenever you build a machine learning model on a set of data, you want to leave a little bit of your data aside as testing data. After the model is created, you run that model against these pictures that have been set aside as a way of testing how good it really is and make sure it's working as intended. That's what AutoML has done here, and what it's telling me is that based on these tests, it will get this right like 96 to 100% of the time. Is our model really that good? Eh, probably not. I think what we're seeing here might be a side effect of having a smaller data set. If only a handful of pictures get set aside as training data, and our model happens to guess those all right, it's going to say, hey, look, I'm 100% accurate, but that's probably a little optimistic. Anyway, moving on, back up here, let me click on this test model link. Here I can upload pictures to the Firebase console, and it'll run them against this model and let me know what results it finds. I already have a few pictures here, so let's try these. Uh, by the way, I should note that your images have to be pings here. JPEGs aren't supported. And uh, the model that it's using here in the cloud for testing purposes is going to be slightly more sophisticated than the more compact version that gets downloaded to your mobile device. But you know, let's try a few of these. And as you can see, it does a pretty good job of correctly labeling my real life rock, paper, and scissors pictures. Okay, seems like this is a model I can use in my app. So I'm going to go ahead and click Use Model. And here I have two options. I can download the model, which gives me a couple of files that I would add directly to my app bundle, or I can publish it, which would mean that it would be available on the web for my apps to download later. Now the trade-offs here are probably pretty obvious. If I were to download the model now, it means my initial app size is going to be bigger, but that model will be available as soon as my app starts up. If I were to publish it to download later, well, I'd have a smaller initial app size, and I have the ability to update my model from the cloud, but I have to worry about our app not being available with this model when our users first start it up. So you're going to have to make the right choice here depending on how sensitive your users are to app install size and how essential it is that your app has these machine learning models available on startup. There's also a third option, by the way, which is to do both. I can download and include a model with my initial app bundle, but then also publish a version on the web that my app can download later. This would be useful if, say, you think you're going to be adding more data to your data set and improving your model over time. For now, though, let's start with the easiest option, which is to include the model locally. Then we'll explore the other two options in a follow-up video. So I'm going to click this download button, and after a few moments, I'm going to click this download button to download it for good. 
This gives me a zip file, which if I unzip it, gives me three files, a manifest file, a text file containing the labels, and the TensorFlow Lite model, which does all the work. Okay, I think we are ready to do some work in Xcode. Now, the first thing I'm gonna do is add the libraries I need to my project. So let me open up my pod file here, and I will add Firebase slash MLVision, and also Firebase slash MLVision AutoML. Let me run a pod install here, and we are good to go. Okay, next I'm gonna open back up the XC workspace. And now I'm just gonna drag this entire folder that I downloaded into my Xcode project. And yes, I will copy items if needed. And now we can start coding, hooray. Okay, let me jump into my view controller here and uh, I'm gonna go ahead and import Firebase. Okay, next we need to properly set up and initialize our local model. In my view did load call, I'm gonna call a helper method that hasn't been created yet called initialize ML model. And I guess we can go ahead and define that next. So to initialize my local model, I'm gonna to need to grab a path to this manifest.json file here. Uh, that should be pretty easy to do. Although, you know, while I'm here, let's rename this folder to something a little simpler like downloaded RPS model. Okay, so now I'm gonna set up my manifest path by saying guard let manifest path equal bundle main path for resource manifest of type JSON in directory and you know what, I will just copy and paste this. Else uh, let's print out a little error and then return. Okay, so now I can create my model object by letting my local model equal auto ML local model with this manifest path. Okay, next we're gonna set up our image labeler. Let me jump up to the top of the file here and set up an optional image labeler property of type vision image labeler. Then I can jump back down to my initialize ML model method and set this up. So I'm gonna create some options for my labeler. I'll let labeler options equal vision on device auto ML image labeler options. And I will specify using the local model with the model I just specified above. The other option I can set here is the confidence threshold. This is that number we saw earlier where we can decide how confident our model should be with the label before it decides to apply it. I think we found that 0.5 was a pretty happy medium and I believe that is the default value, but I always like setting this explicitly. So that's what we're gonna do here. Finally, we will set our image labeler to vision.vision.onDeviceAutoML image labeler, and we will use these options we just created. Great, so I can run this and uh, well, everything works the same as before, but now we have an image labeler set up and ready to go in my app. So let's start doing something with it. MLKit image labelers like to do all their work with a vision image object. So we're gonna need to convert our UI image into one. Now, luckily that's easy to do. Let me jump down into our image picker controller method here and I'm gonna do two things. First, I will return early if the image is somehow nil. Next, I will set our vision image to a vision image with the UI image we got back from our image picker and I can safely force unwrap this now. And finally, I will call perform ML magic on this vision image. And now let's write this method to do the final bit of work for us. I'll go back into my main view controller and we will spec out perform ML magic on vision image of type vision image. Now we can use our image labeler that we've initialized and we will call process on our vision image. And in our completion handler, we get an optional array of labels and an optional error object. So first let's perform some simple error checking. If let error equal error, print, ah, uh, looks like we have an error and the description and then we can return. Okay, next let's grab our array of labels. Uh, I'm pretty sure that if error is nil, this will always exist, but you know what, let's just double check here. Now, if our model doesn't recognize anything in the scene, or at least you know nothing with a high enough confidence threshold, this labels array will still exist, but it will be empty. So uh, I'll check and see. If count is zero, let's change our UI label to, I don't know, because we couldn't figure out what it was. Otherwise, we'll iterate through each vision label in our labels array, Although because this is a single label model, there should really only be one. And uh, let's print out some stuff. Vision labels have two properties we're gonna use here, the text of the label and the confidence value. The confidence value is an NS number, so let's do a little bit of reformatting to make it look nice. We'll create a percentage string using the 0.2F format, and, and we'll take our confidence value, and since it's optional, let's nil coalesce this to zero. And then let's take its double value and multiply it by 100 so that we get a nice looking percentage value. Hmm, seemed like a lot of work. All right, and then we'll set our result string to the text of our label and our confidence percentage. And now we can print that out in our Xcode console and set it to our on-screen UI label too. Great. Oh, and just to be safe, uh, let's make self weak self and we'll make these self references optional. 
All right, I think we're ready to go. Let's give this a try. So let's see how we do here. Uh, it obviously does a pretty good job with these pictures that are basically taken from our training data, but that's kind of to be expected. Let's see how it does with some real world tests. I'm gonna run this on my actual device and uh, we'll bring up the screen here so you can all see it. And I'm gonna try a rock and some paper and scissors, eh, not too bad. Now, if you're having trouble getting good results, make sure you take a picture of your hand on a plain background. That definitely helps. Also, make sure your entire hand is in the frame since that matches the original training data a little better. You can see here I tried a partial hand on a busier background, and my model definitely got more confused here. Uh, finally, you might have noticed that my confidence labels aren't appearing for my rock and scissors throws. Turns out there's currently a little bug in the MLKit library where it likes to add carriage returns to some of my labels. Maybe by the time you see this video, that won't be the case, but for now, there's a really easy fix, so let's do that now. Uh, let me go back into the code here and set my label text equal to vision label dot text, trimming characters in, white spaces and new lines, and then let's use that in my result string. The other thing I'm gonna point out here is I've noticed the docs are very adamant about making sure any image you add is in the up orientation. And this is actually where things get a little weird. Because I have allows editing turned on in my image picker, all images automatically come back to me with the correct up orientation. If I don't have that option turned on and just get photos back directly from the camera, it turns out that because my app is in portrait mode, my images will have a right orientation by default, even though the picture is actually oriented in the way I want. And so after some experimenting, I think I figured out that if you turn off allows editing in your image picker, the best way to fix this is to essentially make a deep copy of your original image, which will create exactly the same image as before, but the orientation will be labeled properly. And uh, you know what? I'll show you how to do that in the next video. For now, because I am allowing editing in my image picker, I'm pretty sure that all my images are coming back the right way. But you know, let's just add some simple error checking here to display an error if for some reason my image is not oriented the way I expect. Something like this. All right, done. Now I'm gonna rerun this one more time and uh, there we go. Now the text is showing my label and the rest of the confidence text and that's great. And this works against both photos that I've already got in my image gallery as well as these live photos. So I think we're at a pretty good stopping point for now. There are three remaining tasks I wanna tackle for my app to work better. First, being able to download an updated model from the server. Uh, second, showing you that deep copy trick. And finally, making use of that live feed so we can detect rock, paper, scissors values in real time. These all sound like great topics for a follow-up video. So I will see you in that follow-up video in another month or two on another episode of Firecasts. <laughs>